looking at moral theories and really putting in some of this critical thinking into, into practice. So just a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about in this module. Uh, basically what an ethical dilemma is. Uh, value theories, prescriptive approaches to how to deal with ethics, uh, behavior, uh, how we should treat other people, how we should act in the world. And then lastly, we are going to look at the eight steps to ethical decision making. So when we think of an ethical dilemma, essentially what we're thinking of is a conflict within values. Uh, if two people have a different set of values or a different value system, then these may be in conflict with one another, right? We don't all value the same things. We don't all think the same type of behavior is acceptable or uh, should be conducted. And so when one of us has a one belief and the other has a contradicting belief, we get this ethical dilemma. And it's important to understand really how we think of ethics, how we think of these uh, moral values in order to really understand uh, how to behave and how to judge or acknowledge other positions um, on the same topic. So there are a few prescriptive approaches that we're going to be looking at. These different approaches essentially assert a ethical position and it's these positions that we're going to be focusing on in this particular module. We're going to be looking at kind of a consequentialist theory with utilitarianism. We're going to look at a deontological theory, um, really focus on obligations and duties, and then um, integrity, so uh, virtue ethics. And we'll be looking at Aristotle for that. So focusing on consequentialist theories, uh, particularly that of utilitarianism, which is perhaps is the best known consequentialist theory. Uh, this theory essentially states uh, that um, the greatest good for the greatest number. So the best decisions uh, yields the greatest benefits for society and the worst decisions uh, yields the worst um, or most harms to society. And so we can see this as a consequentialist theory because what we think of as right and wrong is dependent on the consequence of a particular action. Something that leads to a net good is good. Something that leads to a net bad is bad. And this is heavily uh, depicted in the trolley problem. Uh, so if you can recall this from uh, another class you've taken or you, you've heard about this trolley problem, Essentially, a trolley is bearing down the tracks and it is about to hit five people and you come across the switch and you can flip the switch and the trolley will divert to another track. However, on that other track is one person. And so these are your only options. Uh, there's no uh, jumping aboard and stopping the train or preventing the train or shouting at the people to get off the tracks. Right? It's either let the train barrel down and hit the five people or you can take action to divert the train and uh, kill the one person. And so the question is, what do you do? Uh, and typically most people are going to wanna say that they are going to flip the switch and divert the train. And, and the reason they give the justification is that, well, five lives are more important than one life, right? And obviously a part of this example is that we don't know who these people are, right? So um, we want to take the best odds and, and assume that uh, the greatest good here for the greatest number. And so if you were to pull that switch and divert the train, you were acting like a utilitarian in this instance, right? You were behaving in a way such that you, uh, the guiding principle is greatest good for the greatest number. Now, with this particular theory, uh, of utilitarianism, there are a couple questions that come to mind. And one is that, can I identify all the stakeholders within this consequence kind of theory? So if I'm looking at the consequence of my action and trying to determine my actions, um, goodness or rightness based on the consequences, am I identifying all of the particular stakeholders? Maybe I need to look not just at the victims, 
but the victims of families or the victims of societies. Maybe I need to look at um, within uh, the confines of perhaps maybe business ethics, not just um, an actual stakeholder of a business, not just an owner, but customers or um, people who use a product in order to create their own business, right? So am I able to identify all of these people when making my decision? And is this something realistic when making a split second decision? Um, also, what are the possible actions that I can take? Again, if my uh, the goodness or rightness of my action is based on the consequence, um, what are all the actions that I can take in order to bring about the best net good or the least net harm. And so then also what are the harms and benefits given from a potential decision or action? Can I think about all of the benefits to society or can I think about all of the harms to society before conducting an action? And then lastly, really, uh, what decision will produce the most benefit for the greatest number of people? Right? Am I able to, to really see far enough into the future to know that my action now is going to be a harm or my action now is going to create a benefit for society. And so there are a couple advantages and challenges to this particular consequentialist theory. Um, first is that it's, it's practical, right? We seem to think that when good things happen, the effect of the, or the um, cause of those things was good in the long run, right? And, and this kind of already underlines our way of thinking, particularly in business, right? When you make a decision and your company profits, uh, you made a good decision. Um, and we're not just necessarily talking about monetary profit, but profiting in terms of just kind of a social reputation, a strength of the company, and so forth. And so this seems to be a very similar way to um, act that we do, particularly here in America, where we tend to think politically, right, greatest good for the greatest number, for the most part, right? There are obviously exceptions to this, but we tend to think that what we're doing is right when it benefits the most of society. Uh, the problems, however, with utilitarianism is that it's really difficult to evaluate all the consequences, right? I can't make a decision and think, well, in five years, it's going to result in this, or in 10 years, it's going to result in that. Because if 10 years, it results in something negative, then the decision I made 10 years prior is going to be looked at as a bad decision. And so you're always kind of looking to the past, and it's really hard to ever evaluate what will be good and what will be bad. Uh, another really big problem with utilitarianism is that the rights of minorities are sacrificed. If we're going to say greatest good for the greatest number, then those minorities um, will typically be harmed in this instance. So if I were to say that people who make over $30,000 a year annually uh, don't have to pay taxes anymore, well, the majority of people in the United States make over $30,000, so the majority of people will benefit from this law. However, we have just essentially screwed the minority, right? And those now making less than $30,000 are having to pay taxes, and those typically making less than $30,000 probably can't afford those taxes to begin with. And so we can see with utilitarianism that we're really acting against a minority here. And so this might make for a very undesirable value theory for some. <clears throat> the next is a kind of a focus on duty or obligations, and this we refer to as a deontological theories. Um, you also might hear the term Kantian um, in terms of our duties or our behavior. And this essentially creates very strict, clear, rigid rules um, based on universal principles, right? Uh, things like fairness, rights, justice. So I might think what is right is not lying, in which case this is a rule, this is a principle, so under no circumstance can you ever lie. And this is uh, one of the areas where the uh, theorist uh, Immanuel Kant really explains kind of where moral decisions come from. And so what is moral, essentially, 
is not necessarily the consequence of an action, but the intent. And that intent is something that is logical at its core. And so we know that a decision is logical when if we were to expand our behavior to everybody, if we were to universalize this type of behavior, then that universality would not contradict the intent behind the action. So very worry, I know. Uh, essentially, what he's saying is that if I were to want to lie, right? So I'm in a situation and I want to lie. Uh, I didn't I didn't do my uh, presentation this week. And so I need to tell my boss that something happened. I'm going to lie to my boss so that I don't get in trouble for not doing my presentation. So I want to think to myself, what if everybody lied? Well, if everybody lied, then my boss would know that I'm lying, in which case my telling a lie would serve no purpose. So the intent has been contradicted based on the fact that my behavior can't be universalized, right? And, and this is um, something that's very misunderstood when it comes to deontological uh, theories. Uh, most people you will hear talk about Kantianism or deontology uh, will suggest that when you universalize something, you're essentially just saying, well, what would the world look like if everyone did this? Is it, does it look bad or does it look good, right? So if, if I were to lie, then everybody lies. And do I want to live in a world where there are a bunch of liars? That's not what this theory is saying. What this theory is saying is that the intent is contradicted by the universality of my particular action. So again, take stealing, for instance. I need to steal um, a loaf of bread to feed my family. And so I'm thinking of stealing this loaf of bread. Well, if I universalize this behavior of stealing, then I would want to steal this loaf of bread for my family. That's the intent. However, when I steal this loaf of bread before I'm able to give it to my family, it's then stolen from me and then stolen from that person. So the intent behind stealing has been contradicted. And so these deontological theories create these strict, rigid principles based on the fact that this logical intent is not contradicted when universalized. And so we can see this with things like murder, stealing, lying. Um, if we were to look at something else, for instance, and try to universalize it, let's say giving to charity. Well, I want to give to charity because it makes me feel good. Well, what if everyone gave to charity because it made them feel good? Well, then we'd have a better society, right? That my feeling good is not contradicted by everybody else giving to charity. And so this behavior can be good, right? So we're looking at the, 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 the logical contradictions behind the intent with these particular theories. And so these rules um, are typically found within this kind of deontological uh, approach. Um, again, categorical imperative, this universality. Uh, what kind of world would it be if everyone behaved in this way? Would I want to live in this world? Um, again, not would I want to live in this world because the world would be a better place, but would the intent be contradicted in this world or would it make sense to continue to do this action? Um, other kind of universal thinking principles that we can think about, uh, we look at John Rawls' Veil of Ignorance uh, when deciding what's fair. So how we know what's fair is that we need to make decisions um, and not know about our identity and status. So if I were to think about making a decision in the world, I wouldn't think of that decision as a white male. I would need to go back to before I was born, put up this, what Rawls calls a veil of ignorance. And so if I were to think to myself, like, is should we have slavery, right? Um, me not knowing what race, not knowing what sex, not knowing any of those things about myself, does this sound like something that I would want to be born into? And if I don't know my position, then I might look and be like, well, if I were to be born in this slave class, 
then that would not be ideal. And so slavery is not a good thing, right? And so I can make that choice through this veil of ignorance. And um, the same thing goes for, for everything else, right? If I were to think of myself, if I were to think about raising taxes, if I were to think about creating laws, think of yourself not in the position you are currently in, think of a position from this kind of uh, ignorant position and not knowing your place in society and then act on whether or not something makes sense. And then we have a, a kind of golden rule, right? Treat others as you would have them treat you. Again, we have these clear rules, these clear principles that guide our behavior. Um, but of course, all of these have their own problems as well. Um, so some questions we might ask ourselves uh, for the deontological position are which values or principles apply, right? This is part of the problem with the golden mean uh, theory, right? Treat others as you would want them to be treated. Well, uh, I want, right, massages all the time. My shoulders always hurt. And so if a stranger just, if I'm eating dinner and a stranger came up to me and just started massaging my shoulders, I love it. That'd be great. Um, that doesn't mean I can just go up to random people and start massaging them because other people don't find that enjoyable and it could be very creepy for others. And so my values and someone else's values, again, might collide. There might be a ethical dilemma in question, in which case these strict rules may not apply, right? What we think is a strict rule here in America may not be a strict rule in Saudi Arabia and vice versa. Also, what are my duties and obligations? Again, how do I know what these principles ought to be? How do I know what my obligations are in my society and so forth? It's unclear, and it seems like it would kind of bounce around between a kind of moral relativist position where um, a society deems obligations one way and another society deems them another way, um, and even on an individual um, egoist uh, perspective. I may think my obligations are different from what my neighbor thinks. Also, um, lastly, kind of what would be a fair action if identities were unknown? So again, going back to Rawls' veil of ignorance, is this something that we can actually do? Is this, can I take myself out of the equation or am I always going to think like the person that I am because I can't really escape that? Um, and so we have these types of principles, but there are questions that we really need to kind of focus in on, right? Again, if everyone behaved in a certain way, um, would my intent to an action be negated? Um, how should I treat others based upon how I want to be treated, right? All of these come with questions that might throw a wrench into this deontological theory. And so certain advantages is, again, kind of a consistent approach that we typically find within uh, policy debates um, in politics. We see this in, in politics, we see this in society, right? There, there, this seems to be the approach that we take um, in terms of creating these strict rules. Um, but problems, however, is really determining which rules and principles to follow. Um, Again, one person might think that one obligation should be followed while another person might think another obligation should be followed. And so we have all of these people who have these different obligations, in which case we might have to resort now back to utilitarianism, where it's the greatest number of those voting for this particular policy. Um, also, deciding kind of really what takes precedence uh, within certain instances, right? If I follow one rule and someone else follows another rule, but we have this conflict, then who's going to be right? Who's going to, whose obligation will take precedence in this instance? Um, and really reconciling this deontological and consequentialist approach when they conflict. So again, if I were to create this policy, here's a hard rule, but everyone else thinks that there's a hard rule as well. Are we going to say, well, the most votes for this particular rule wins out? Or are we going to protect minorities in this instance because of the problems with utilitarianism? Right? How is that going to, to come about? And also just the idea that there are often exceptions in the world. There are often gray um, 
there's often gray space when, when doing an action. So I might think, okay, lying is always wrong. Well, maybe not always wrong. If I'm trying to surprise my partner um, on uh, her birthday, then I might want to lie and say I'm doing something else. I don't really have anything planned for you. And then, you know, throw out the surprise. Uh, would we as a society say, like, you're wrong for lying? It's, no, this seems to be an okay instance, it would seem, to, to tell a lie. Um, and so, so we have those challenges as well. And then uh, virtue ethics. Uh, virtue ethics is the third. These three being main moral theories, right? You have uh, consequentialist utilitarianism, you have deontology, and you have uh, virtue ethics. And virtue ethics really focuses on the integrity of a moral actor, rather considering the actual act. And so in this instance, I'm not actually telling you what to do in a given situation like the other two theories would, right? The other two theories would say, this is what you should do in this case because it maximizes the greatest good for the greatest number. Or, this is what you should do in this case because it's the logical principle of action to take. Virtue ethics is essentially uh, making people the best people so that they act with good character, good motivation, and good intention. And so there isn't really a rule book of how to act in this instance and how to act in that instance. Instead, you have these moral exemplars, essentially, that are good people, and we look up to those good people, and by looking up to those good people, we become good people, and when we're good people, we make good decisions. Right? But you might be able to already see the, the problems that this particular theory is, is going to create. And so what does it mean to be a person of integrity in this situation? So if I were to be in a situation, um, what does it mean to have good integrity, right? Maybe I'm making a decision uh, that is kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. And so it's kind of a toss up. Um, also, what ethical community will hold me the highest ethical standard? So again, you run into this problem of a character and relativism or egoism, where what I think is best, what I think holds the greatest integrity, uh, may be different from what somebody else holds as the uh, highest integrity, based upon my place, based upon my time, and so forth. And so we can ask ourselves, what would the broader community think if we were, uh, uh, if my action were disclosed? So again, the New York Times test, when you are going to conduct an action, um, how would the world look at that action if it were to be publicized everywhere? Uh, would people um, celebrate your behavior or would uh, people have disdain for it? And uh, what would my harshest moral critic think when it comes to me doing this thing? Would someone criticize my action? Um, or would my, even my critic think, yeah, you did what you could, you did the best that you could in this situation. And, and again, what's my ethical role model? Who is my ethical role model? Who am I looking up to, right? We often do this in society where we look to these moral exemplars and think like, oh, this person's a good person. I want to be like this person. And then we find out, right, later that that person's not a good person. They're a terrible person. It's like, oh, okay, well, like, I don't want to be like that person anymore. And so... We want to kind of ask ourselves, right, who should be my moral exemplar and why? Who should be my role model and why? What makes sense in that regard? And so the advantages is, is again, it seems as though it would make sense that we build good people to make good decisions. Um, it kind of emphasis on the, on the good, right, which is incredibly subjective, but taking in a very kind of loose and broad meaning, it seems to kind of make sense. And this theory relies upon community standards. So again, like you act within a community, right? You do what a community thinks is good. You become part of this community and so far. The problems, of course, is that, again, one community may disagree with another community, right? What I think is good and virtuous might be different from what someone in Thailand thinks is good and virtuous, or what somebody in Los Angeles thinks is good and virtuous. And 
most people haven't really done this kind of thinking or work, right? We don't put a lot of emphasis on um, integrity, on character building, right? We don't learn these type of things so much in school. You're just kind of thrust into the world. Hey, learn these things like math, English. Hopefully your parents and teachers kind of impart some type of integrity and, and uh, character building skills on you. But then again, we are subject to the idea of, can my community be wrong, right? Think back to times in history when we looked at societies that have gone off the rails. Um, obviously, most commonly and notably, we look at Nazi Germany in the 20th century, in the mid 20th century, and we see, right, people learning virtuous behavior, but was it virtuous based on the fact that maybe the community was wrong? Maybe the community was making decisions or thinking that this is how people should act when really, right, the rest of the world was saying, no, that's not good. And so there are all these different ways in which we can act ethically, right? There are different moral theories so that when we're acting, we're not just acting based on, oh, right, golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Or we're not just saying, here are some clear principles or here is clear, greatest good for the greatest number. A lot goes into these. And so when we express these positions, right, we need to use these critical thinking skills in order to evaluate and acknowledge, right, goodness from badness, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, um, types of fallacious material that uh, is expressed. We need to really look at these particular theories critically to analyze them and understand really how we should be acting, right? We can't just take these things as um, scripture. And so when it comes to making uh, ethical decisions, it's important that we take these kind of eight steps. Um, and these should be done um, throughout any real kind of ethical decision making, critical thinking. And one is to, the first is to, to just gather all the facts, right? Again, this is part of a kind of critical thinking process about ethical uh, moral theories. And gather all the facts, right? So if I'm going to do an action, uh, what are all the facts, right? Do I know everything? Think back to the trolley problem, right? The train's barreling down at five people. I can switch the, uh, the track and have the train divert to the track with one person. So what are all the facts? Well, the facts are the train's barreling down. There's five people over here, one person over here. I'm in control of this. Right? I'm trying to get as much as I can, right? If I were able, right, like who are the people on the tracks, right? It might make a difference if you have a young, um, scientist on the one track with the one person and then you have five 90 year old convicts on the other track right that might change your behavior in a situation and so we want to gather up all the facts and then define the ethical issues right so what are the issues based upon these different theories and when it comes to ethical issues right who's involved what are the, what are the behaviors that are supposed to be expected or expressed in this instance and then identify all the parties involved. So again, uh, there's myself if I'm on the train tracks, right? Me switching the train, even though I'm not going to hit, the, even though the train isn't going to ever hit me, right? My uh, psychological well-being from having to make such a decision is impacted. Uh, you have the five people on the track. You have the one person on the track. Maybe there's a, a conductor that can't um, do anything. Was lost control, right? Maybe that person. The affected parties might be family members, might be society at large. Who knows, right? Trying to gather up all that information and then identify the consequences. So again, if this one person dies, what are the consequences of that? If these five people die, what are the consequences of that? If I pull that lever and actively take part in killing this one individual, right? How does that affect me? What are the consequences that I might face and so forth? And then identify certain obligations. So what? What am I obliged to do in this situation? Am I obligated to save the five because my society is very utilitarian? Maybe my society suggests that I shouldn't do anything and I just should not get involved and let fate take its course. Um, even though that's kind of a stupid reason, um, but that's for another lecture. Uh, what are the obligations in this instance? 
And then what about me? What about my integrity here? So again, what will allow me to sleep at night based upon these actions, right? What do I think is the most integral action to do or position to take in this given situation? I can then think creatively, right? Maybe I can think like, oh, let's do it. I'm going to go run, jump on the train, right? Uh, pull the emergency brake, stop it, save everybody. Maybe I can't do that. Maybe I can shout. Maybe I can't. What are the different options I have available? And then lastly, checking your gut and just thinking like, okay, well, like based upon society, based upon what I've grown up knowing, like what do I just feel is right? And so these are the things that we should be doing with this ethical decision making. And the, the critical thinking that is involved with making certain decisions and thinking about different things like moral theories, right? It's not just as easy as, oh, here's a saying in a Bible, well, I'm going to do that. Well, there's a lot more that goes into it. Um, there's a lot more uh, consequences or obligations, parties being affected, right? A lot more things to take into account. And it's important that we're doing our best critically uh, to think about these particular issues, to think about behavior in order to make the best decision possible.